<laughs> so today's going to be part four, but this was part one of the resurrection series that I'm talking about. Um, when I was growing up as a Christian, Christmas was a big deal, Easter was a big deal, but, you know, there's this period called Lent that people go through, right? Like a lot of people know what that is, and it's leading up to the crucifixion. It's reminding ourselves how important it was that Jesus died for our sins. And they do 40 days of fasting, and we were told to always, you know, give something up that was really valuable to us. And that, that's a good idea, you know, that, that idea of, of fasting is just really powerful. But there's a 50-day period between the resurrection and the day of Pentecost. And that's a really big deal, right? Because to the, to the Jews, they were coming out of Egypt, and Passover was a miracle of the opening of the Red Sea and coming out of slavery. And then 50 days later, Moses is up on the mountain and he gets the law, and that's what the, the Jews celebrate in their holiday. But you know what we celebrate on the day of Pentecost is when Holy Spirit came. And God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. So this first one was from a couple of years ago. Um, we had been to Glory of Zion in Texas in 2019. When we came back, I shared a vision that I saw while I was down there and how the Lord opened up uh, the season that we're in uh, and, and how, how important this holiday is that we call Easter, right? So I would just ask just this open-ended question. If you say it to most people, what does Easter mean if you're a Christian? It celebrates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? I'd say it's probably the greatest day in all of history on the, on the church calendar. His advent in Christmas is important, but if he didn't come out of that tomb, then death would not have been defeated. And the reason death was defeated is because Jesus lived a sinful life. And if the wages of sin are death, and you live a sinless life, there's no death because there's no sin. There's no paycheck from the devil. Anybody know what that's like, getting a paycheck from the devil? When you sinned and he gave you your paycheck, it wasn't fun, was it? I'd much rather work for Jesus. So, what happened? How did it become this? Well, would it be just like the devil to get our minds off of the fact that the resurrection power lives inside of us and get us sidetracked with addiction to sugar? <laughs> right? He, he plays dirty. This one on the bottom left there, you could actually buy that at the store and set that up on your lawn. Like to celebrate what? The Easter Bunny? Let's not do that. Let's recognize this is really important that people understand the hope that we have. We're going to talk about the verse that says, walk by faith and not by sight. Right? We've, sure, we've all heard that. But if, if you dig in a little bit, you realize that we have faith in something. And the faith is that our bodies are going to be resurrected. Yeah. That's a really good thing. The older we are, the louder we should shout. Yeah. <laughs> right? We're getting new bodies. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm real happy about that. So let's keep this picture in mind, not the Easter bunny and egg hunts, and, you know, I know that's fun, I get it, but it's like Halloween, like, whoa, no, I don't think we have to celebrate one of Satan's holidays, and the Easter Bunny is just a big distraction from this. No greater love has anyone than this, that they would lay down their life for a friend, and we get called into this Christian life, and then we lay down our lives for other people because we're modeling the master, the one that we aspire to, to be like. And he's forming us into his image, and his image is a servant, right? I did not come to be served, I came to serve. And I can't be reminded of this enough, because it's easy to start bossing people around, isn't it? No, we don't do that. So this was uh, Palm Sunday this year, was part two. And then this was when we spoke the day of Passover, Easter, uh, Resurrection Sunday. It's got a lot of names. And we talked about it as finished. If you remember a couple, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this cycle of sin. And you read it throughout the Bible. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they were evicted from the garden. And, the, and God posted an angel and said, nope, sorry, sin is separating you from the Father. You have to stay out there. And we lost a whole lot when that happened. But we gained a whole lot on Pentecost. And Pentecost is powerful because Jesus went and brought his blood to the mercy seat in heaven. And once that sacrifice was accepted by the Father, boom, he gives us Holy Spirit. 
Otherwise, it would be hard to understand what he says, I'm leaving you, and it's good that I go away. Do you remember when he said that? To the disciples, that would seem counterintuitive, wouldn't it? You've seen all these miracles while you were here. How could it be better? In fact, he said, greater things than these will be done by little old me and little old you. It doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter what any credentials the world would give. It matters if you're men and women after God's own heart. And then you preach a message without even saying a word by the way you live your life. And other people can be drawn into the kingdom just by the witness of watching how you live. I heard one uh, theologian said the reason that he sent them out two by two into the culture was so that people could see how Christians interact with each other different than how the culture interacts, how they help one another. One puts 1,000 to flight, two put 10,000 to flight. It's that threefold cord of a partnership, not just in a marriage, but in life. Our connection with each other gives us protection from sin. That's, that's the motto of the local church. When you're living lives together, you're not alone. Think about that isolation. If, if you're already in prison, they punish you more by putting you in solitary confinement. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that bed. Get up out of that depression. Allow the joy of the Lord. Come into the presence of God because where the presence of the Lord is, there's freedom. Chains break because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, you probably like me have found out that the longer you serve the Lord, the more humbling it is because you end up realizing you had a lot of good ideas, but they weren't always God ideas. And you have to learn how to separate those two things out. And the way you do that is by praying. And that's the other thing. When we get the Spirit of God, it's not just about the gifts of the Spirit. It's the nature of God living right on the inside of you. And in the days when Jesus was being taught, and they didn't have schools the way we have them, people were apprentices underneath a, a, an expert. So carpenter or how, any other of the trades, boat building or fishing. You didn't sit in a classroom and learn in a book. You went out and you did the work and you watched. And then you were watched by somebody who was uh, apprenticing you, who was uh, developing you, discipling you, to be like them in that skill. And we've lost that, and it's a little too much head knowledge now. So if you would do it with me for the next few weeks, focus on what happened between the resurrection, even that day, how many different people he appeared to. And in the Gospel of John, he was walking on the beach, and it's got this language like they were afraid to say it, but they knew it was the Lord, but they didn't know for sure. You know how that was? And, and Thomas said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see him myself and, and I touch him. And Jesus said, okay, go ahead, put your finger right here. And he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Changed my mind. And I said this already, like, this would be part four, okay? So two years ago was part one. Uh, Palm Sunday, we call it the week before what we celebrate Easter, would have been part two. Easter Sunday would have been part three, and this is part four now. Of all that same theme of the resurrection and helping us understand just how amazingly powerful it is and to just be upset that we allow the substitution of an Easter bunny to take away the power that we should be focusing on so much. Because this life is a trial for sure, but the life that's coming is going to be amazing. And it's not this spirit disembodied, you know, sitting on a cloud playing a harp. It's going to be actively ruling and reigning with Christ forever. And that makes it much easier for me to go through whatever trials I'm going through. Because I know there's a cause. Like David said to his brothers, is there not a cause? We have a, a history uh, as people of God. We have the, 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 the testaments of God in us. We have his presence. We're his people. This giant is an uncircumcised Philistine, and he's going down. Yeah. It took a young guy to do that who had courage. You know, another thing I realized the longer I've been a pastor is how much power unbelief has. That it's got its own dark anointing. When, when we allow too much doubt to come into our minds and we stop taking every thought captive and we drift away because of our circumstances or my, my job is very secular. I, I work with mostly unsaved people when I'm in the marketplace. And, and it's also kind of a greed industry, right? People go to Wall Street because they can make a lot of money. And we know that it says the love of money is the root of all evil. But why wouldn't he want us there as missionaries, right? And New York's the financial capital of the world, so there's some big demons over there. But God is bigger. And we're seeing those people getting saved all the time because they realize how empty it is. 
and how hard they worked, and they came up empty. The devil made them false promises. So this is the hope I want you to have, is to understand that when I say walk by faith and not by sight, it's faith in knowing that this life, when it's over, we are getting a major upgrade to the way that we're going to be living and ruling and reigning with Christ. Because it could seem a little boring to just be sitting on a cloud playing a harp. <laughs> and the way Eugene Peterson said it in the message, instead of just saying walk by faith and not by sight, he said it's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. And it's that don't yet see part that I want to keep focusing on today to know that it's going to be a pathway into a whole new life that's going to be a major upgrade. Okay, I think I made that point. And, you know, I love this picture. I don't know if any of you have seen this in the, in the popular culture, but it's actually, oh, I'll show you what it is. It's somebody decided to, to show in a picture form every time there's a cross-reference in Scripture. And this is the Bible as the first hyperlink book. <laughs> You know how when you go into uh, some of these Bible programs, they let you click on the notes section and they'll show you where the other scriptures are? And there are 63,779 cross-references in the Bible. <laughs> so you want, you want to know about warfare and forgetting who we really are? Easter Bunny is resurrection. Like, that doesn't even mean anything. But, but of course... Distract, distract, distract from the anointing because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you and me. And the devil, I heard Easter say it during prayer this morning, he has no authority. He only has the power of lies. And it's really powerful if you don't know the truth. Anybody else besides me? Before you were a Christian? Man, you had three meals a day of lies. If it feels good, do it, man. That was at the top of my list. Too many shortcuts. It was, it was only the pleasures of sin for a season, man, but the payback was brutal. So why I'm bringing this up is that we're part of a big story. We're part of the Israel story, right? When they came through the Red Sea and were freed from, from the slavery of Egypt, we come through the Red Sea of sin through the Jesus blood, and we come out the other side. It doesn't mean we never sin again, but we're equipped and we're empowered now with the tools that God gives us to break the power of the sinful nature, to break the power of the ease of lying. And I like to use this because I'm in sales, and, and salespeople say, well, I didn't lie. And I remind them when you go into a courtroom and you put your hand on the Bible, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? Right? The first one, tell the truth. Okay, it's the whole truth that a lot of us get in trouble with because you all just give part of the story and say, I didn't lie. <laughs> but now there might be times that telling the whole truth could hurt somebody's feelings, so God wants you to be sensitive about that, not legalistic about it, but it's easier, right? Little children know, like, who ate the cookie? I told you not to put your hand in the cookie jar. And we all just know, like, might as well try it. I'm going to get in trouble. Maybe I'll get away with it. And that carries into our, our adult life. So why I'm putting this picture up is just to help us understand that it's very dangerous to just take little fractions of Scripture and just extract a little truth out of that one Scripture without recognizing that it fits in a bigger picture. Would you agree? You found that to be true. And the saying that they teach you in Bible college is text without context could be a pretext. Anybody heard that one? You only read one verse and don't get the... The, the relevance of the rest of the scriptures around it, and that's what I call fractions, right? You're just taking a little piece of it, and you could misunderstand it and miss the full revelation. And you know this, it's a word that's inside a verse, it's inside a chapter, that's inside a book, that's inside the Testament, old or new, and that's inside the Bible. So that's a challenge for us as Christians to make sure that we're not just reading the Bible, but we're studying the Bible to show ourselves approved. And it's beautiful that there's really no excuse anymore. Everything's free. If you have an internet connection, you can have the most powerful Bible tools. Like I, I would have just been so happy in the 80s when I was having five books and concordances spread out on the dining room table when I was preparing messages. It's just amazing now. Never mind all the free teaching that you can find on YouTube. And uh, If you want, if you're hungry, you can be fed these days, right? All right, so I want to do what I said, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 
7 is the verse I quoted that most of us would know as walk by faith and not by sight. But Eugene Peterson said it this way, it's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. It's like your mission statement in the morning. Lord, I'm on my knees. I'm taking communion before you. I know that my flesh is going to be weak today. My spirit's willing, but my flesh got some weaknesses in it. So as I break this bread in the morning before I go out, I'm acknowledging that I need you. I need to identify with you during the course of this day. I don't know what's coming, but I do know the enemy's going to try to set some landmines and some traps and some temptations. But I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I want to walk by faith in what the end is going to be. I'm going to keep my eyes on the prize. And my goal today is to make you see the prize is bigger than you might realize. And that there's this amazing life that's coming for us. It doesn't mean we earn a better position in the life to come. It means that while we're here, he wants us to be the most effective ministers possible so that we can advance the kingdom. The Bible says he doesn't want one person to perish. So maybe you're a little... Uh, disinclined to want to witness to people. I get that. A lot of people are disinclined to witness. They feel like I really need to know more about it before I start sharing. What if I do it wrong or whatever? That's just known, right, throughout the body of Christ. Many Christians have never led another Christian to the Lord. But when you start putting these spokes together that we're talking about having right here on this property, right, a ministry for people who are suffering from addiction, a deliverance ministry that we've been running since the first day that we started that, thanks to my wife, but also even handing out food to people that are needy, that they have a very strong felt need that, that they're in a tough place in their lives. Well, can we pray with you? And we used to do that at the, at the cafe that we ran across from the Burnersville train station. People would walk in, and we had very discerning people behind the counter. They would give prophetic words. We had the healing rooms in the back. There's a guy in the back here that got healed there. Is that Matt? Am I wrong? Because I saw, I saw Dave here. I thought maybe Matt was here. Sorry. Dave Bell's son. Say hi to Dave and Debbie. Their son, Matt, came to our uh, coffee shop because one of their friends was witnessing to him, and he was just feeling like she won't let up. This lady won't let up. So she said, well, well just go, let's just go get a cup of coffee. He had hurt his shoulder very badly at playing hockey. And, he, and, and she gets him to go in the back to the healing rooms, and he walks in, and he gets prayed for, and he falls down under the power of the Spirit. He stands up with a healed shoulder. All right? Radical change. Goes on to be now full-time working for the Lord. It's incredible. Right? So it doesn't happen every time, but it's much harder to catch a fish if you don't even have the line in the water. Right? They don't usually just jump in the boat. So even if you're not great at it, find ways to get people in touch with the Lord through real practical ways. And, you know, you, you might have to stand before him and say, I wasn't very good at something. But we don't want to say we didn't try. All right. So you heard that verse as well in Philippians 3. We're going to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling. It's good to think about these things in the morning. Pray in the morning. Start your day there. Connect. Get re-grounded before you even leave the house because then you're ready, more ready than you would have been. And he says, look, I know I haven't arrived. How many of you would agree with that verse? I know that I have not yet arrived. But there's one thing I'm doing. I'm leaving my old life behind and I'm putting everything on the line for this mission. And the mission is more than just going to heaven when you die. As important as that is, we would never denigrate that goal. But it's also to be a minister of the gospel while I'm here. It's also to live my life to advance God's kingdom and to shift the culture. And boy, the culture's shifting without us in a really bad direction, right? So if you could be light in the middle of darkness, you're going to shine brighter. Putting everything on the line for this mission. I'm sprinting towards the only goal that counts to cross the line, to win the prize, to hear God's call to resurrection. Here it is. Hear God's call to resurrection life found in Jesus. Not just on the other side. Not just when this life's over. We get the chance to live resurrection life right now. So why wouldn't we want to evict the baggage that's slowing us down? That's how it says it in Hebrews. We're going to run the race and we're going to shed the things, the besetting sins that so easily slow us down. Take them off and put on the garment of Christ and walk under that power. And, you know, maybe you feel like that's happening. Great. But it could still be more. We can yield more to him. We can surrender more. And you'll do better on your job. Man, I'm telling you, there's, there's a whole bunch of ways of thinking about this. It's not to be selfish about it. But the more you're tuned in to the Lord, you're going to make better decisions. And sin 
Prayerlessness is a sin identified in the Bible. So if we're not asking, it's nobody's fault but ours, right? So I'm going to try to expand on this. What is the prize? If we're going to press towards the prize for the high calling, how do we elaborate it more than just going to heaven when we die, which is a good goal? Is it this? Disembodied bliss. <laughs> right? We're just floating. We're floating around, which when I was growing up, it would have been, that, this is how it was kind of pictured to me, because Holy Ghost, Casper the Friendly Ghost, I don't know if you remember this, somebody who's there but not there, just kind of floating around in the spirit. But scripture's very clear, no. <laughs> it says in 2 Corinthians 5.1, when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies. Okay? That's the prize of the high calling in Christ. We're going to rule and reign with him. And all this deterioration that we see in these bodies, it's going to be replaced. And you might say, well, do you have any more verses that say that? And I would say, yes. <laughs> Philippians 3.21, Christ will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Look at somebody and say, that's good news. That's really good news. Because he had that transformed body that we saw after the resurrection. He's walking on the road to Emmaus, and he's talking to the two disciples, and they don't know it's him. But what does he do? He takes and blesses the bread, and he starts to have communion with them, and all of a sudden their eyes were open. Because the Spirit filled the room. And Adam and Eve sinned by taking something and eating it. And sin came into the world. So Jesus comes and reverses it by saying, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to take it, break it, bless it, and then your eyes will be open. Because Adam and Eve's eyes were open to sin. Our eyes are open to the Lord. So that's a great one. And my body's going to be transformed into his glorious body according to the working which he is able to, even to subdue all things to himself. And then in John 20... It says, Jesus said to Thomas, and I know a lot of you remember this one, reach your finger in here and look at my hands. Reach your hands in here and put it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, Thomas, but be believing. And similarly, behold my hands and feet that it's I myself. Handle me and see me. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones that you see that I have. It's hard to understand, isn't it? Because how did he walk into the room if he was a physical body? And, and the apostles were hiding, and he didn't come in through the door. So there was some new dimension that we're all going to have when we're resurrected that gives me a lot of hope. And I'm going to try to keep myself in shape right now because I know in the natural, your body's going to start to deteriorate. Anybody else notice it's a lot harder to lose weight when you get older? <laughs> That's the devil, man. I remember eating a whole pizza when I was in college. One sitting. I won't tell you other things I did in college, but I didn't gain weight because I was playing. I was on the football team, so I was burning off a lot of energy. But my metabolism was running a lot faster. But as you get older, other things happen. <laughs> Sorry, I know some of you are getting triggered right now. Another romantic evening comes and goes. The excitement is overwhelming. So as you're getting older, you're like, yeah, well, maybe playing a harp on a cloud doesn't sound so bad, actually. <laughs> Compared to what's happening to my body, that would still be an upgrade. Don't let that happen. I think it looks more like this. <laughs> I think we can, we can experience it now, like we did this morning with that song, Awakening is coming to our city. We're, we're going to be active members of the army of Christ. We're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ in these new bodies, not some Easter bunny, Casper the friendly ghost playing some harp on a cloud. Stop! It's not what the Bible says. It does talk about spirit. I, I understand that. But he said, look at me. A spirit doesn't have a body. And we're going to be transformed into his glorious body. We just read it. All right? And, and that's, uh, this is the chapter that walk by faith, not by sight, comes from is 2 Corinthians 5. And I'm using the voice version. I find the voice is very kingdom-minded in the way they help us understand Scripture. And, and it's not so much that fractional little pieces. They have a good understanding uh, of the kingdom mindset that many of us were not taught. It says that we know that if our earthly house, which is a mere tent, can easily be taken down, it's destroyed. 
Now, if you just read that on its own, earthly house could sound like, well, Jesus said he was going, and he was going to prepare another place, and when we get to heaven, we're going to have mansions. And you think he's referring to a, a house. No, our body is the tent that he's referring to. And we can argue about that after if you want. Just don't shout me down now. <laughs> but I know that's what he meant. And then, okay, so we know that this earthly house, a mere tent that can easily be taken down, is destroyed. We will then live in an eternal home, the new body that we're going to get. In the heavens, a building crafted by divine, not human hands. Now, in the heavens could get us back on that cloud with the harp, but in the heavens, it's God's kingdom realm, which is a very present help available to you right now. See, it's not billions of miles away. You can tap into the kingdom right here. It's, it's in our midst. You have to step into it. And you can think about when it says in John that uh, unless you become born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But it starts by saying you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again, right? It's there, but until the Lord opens your eyes, you don't see it. But then in order to step into it, you've got to make some tough decisions to walk away from the world and to operate in God's kingdom rules. Am I losing anybody? Good. So this eternal body that we're going to have, it says crafted uh, not by the divine in the heavens is just the new earth that's coming, okay? It says in Revelation that heaven comes down into this planet. Currently in this tent of a house, we continue to groan. <laughs> Anybody relate? The older you get, the louder the, the sound is as you're getting out of the car. And my grandmother, when she was getting up in her 70s, she would go to sit down and it would be like, as soon as she tipped, boom. <laughs> like, like she lost the strength in her legs. And she's like, man, I need some new uh, shock absorbers because these things are going. And she had a great sense of humor about it. But, you know, it gets a little dangerous if your shock absorbers aren't working. <laughs> so we groan and we ache with a deep desire. And when you get to heaven, you can say, hey, Adam and Eve, I got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> like, I didn't want no deteriorating body. And we're told that though the outward man is deteriorating, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Thank you, Lord. So we're groaning, and we want to be sheltered in our permanent home. So we get that as time goes by, we look more and more like that guy on the couch, right? <laughs> because then we will be truly clothed and comfortable, protected by a covering of our own nakedness. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for protecting us. I didn't read it right. We'll be truly clothed and comfortable, protected by a covering for our current nakedness. Now, we're not obviously naked, but when they sinned in the garden, they were aware that they were naked. Prior to that, they had no shame. And the first thing that came is they figured they had to hide themselves and hide from God. Think that applies in our lives today? If we're not sure of who we are in Christ, it's easy just to take on a counterfeit. But when you're, when you're truly walking in your identity with the Lord and you know who you are, you, um, you take comfort in the fact that the struggles that we're dealing with now we're not going to have for eternity. So I got one more I, I, I thought was worth showing you. <laughs> not making fun of anybody, but you got to try. Sometimes you got to try. You know, if you can't swim, you can roll the wheelchair in the water and you can cool off. And uh, it says, I see people around my age mountain climbing. But I feel good getting my leg through my underwear without losing my balance at this <laughs> stage of my life. I'm not trying to get anybody depressed. I'm saying, I walk by faith, not by sight. I don't care what gravity's doing. I'm going to have a better body later. <laughs> gravity's from the devil, man, I'll tell you. <laughs> the fact is that this tent that we, we anxiously moan, we're fearing the naked truth of our reality. We crave... What is it that we crave to, to be clothed? We want to reverse that curse of Adam and Eve. We want to be in our eternal body, not this deteriorating body that, that sin is affecting. So that what is temporary, when we get to the other side, what is temporary and mortal will be wrapped completely in life. But how many know when Holy Spirit comes into your life, you're already tasting what it's going to be like? It's called a down payment. You're already getting a piece of what we're going to have for eternity. And that should make you really happy because it brings joy. That's where your strength comes from is joy. It's been a little harder to have joy during COVID, hasn't it? I mean, there's some really grievous things happening to people. So it's not that we're ignoring those things, but 
It's just like the devil to just take our strength away by robbing us of our joy. I don't know if you saw the movie uh, Bridge of Spies with Tom Hanks. And uh, he keeps looking at the guy who's on trial, and he's like, you understand the implications here. If they find you guilty, you're going to go back, and you know, you're going to have to go back to Russia. Are, are you a little worried about that? And he says, would it help? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a Christian answer that is. He just says it three different times. You can find the clip. It's like, it's brilliant. Like, why would I waste energy on something I can't control? I'm going to focus on the truth of what God's promises are, and I'm going to keep reminding myself what those promises are. I'm wrapped completely in life. And verse 5 says, this is passion, this is no empty hope about this new body that we're going to get in this new life. This is no empty hope. God himself is the one who prepared us for this wonderful destiny. And to confirm this promise, he's given us the Holy Spirit like an engagement ring as a guarantee. I just got to tell you, that's so helped me to think about presence of Holy Spirit in my life right now. It's a reminder that the wedding hasn't happened yet, but I'm engaged. I'm going to be his bride, and he loves me, and he never says, no, I don't want to talk to you right now. You're off the list. You can't come into my presence. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. Anytime we come to him with a need, he's awake and open for business. Thank you, Lord. In light of this, we live with a daring passion. That's what it says in the voice. Uh, if I stopped and asked a bunch of Wall Street friends that aren't Christians, what do you think of when you think of a Christian? Daring passion might not be at the top of the list. But when you're living, walking by faith, and have the right prize in mind, you don't mind taking risks for God because you know there's a cause. And you also know that if you fail, let's just say, I don't believe you really failed if you gave it your best shot. But not given a shot. He was upset, right? He gave, he gave the talents to different people and the ones who used it, he was happy with. But the ones who didn't use it, that's who he was upset with. So let's not let the enemy keep us in spiritual lockdown. Well, I better not say this. I might get in trouble. What if I look foolish? What if, what if, what if, what if? Ah, that's, that doesn't take any faith to do that. So in light of this hope that we have of the new body, we live with a daring passion and know that our time spent in this body is also time we're not present with the Lord. So, okay, Adam and Eve did sin. We did get a deteriorating body, but we're promised a whole new version, and I'm going to make the best of what I got while I'm here. The path we walk is chartered by faith, not by what we see with our eyes. And that's where Eugene Peterson said, it's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps me going. It's what I have my faith in, what the prize is. I'm pressing for a prize for an eternal weight of glory that I'm going to carry that makes suffering in this life a little easier, just a little easier to deal with and tolerate. I keep an eternal perspective. So helpful. And then Eugene Peterson says, do you, you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? Say no. <laughs> when the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile from God for homecoming with God. Amen? All right, I'm almost done. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> Holy Spirit. And this is really good news. I love this. This is just a commentary from the voice version. It says, Holy Spirit transforms believers so they're conformed into the image of Jesus. Yes? Agree? You've been conformed into his image. It says that in 2 Corinthians that we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. King James says we go from glory to glory. Awesome. Thank you, Father, that we could do that. that you're, you're giving me an ability to be conformed to the image of Jesus. But follow me on this, okay? It says this change means that believers embody Jesus' death through the suffering that we go through and participate in his present risen life. That's a mouthful, right? Because nobody likes suffering. We get it. But that's what Paul said in, in Philippians 2. He said, I want to be found in him. And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. Yeah. So as we're doing things, as we're loving difficult people, right? You ever have to hug a porcupine of a person, but you know the Lord is telling you to do this? That's a form of suffering. It's a form of suffering to be accused of things that you know didn't happen to you. But I was talking to Boris, our bass player. He wrote a book about how the corporate life can be so full of landmines. And we, we were doing a little 
video shoot so he can advertise his book. And it's like when, when another coworker came to him and gave him bad news, he had a choice not to react right away. It's because we have a spirit inside of us of God that says, wait a minute, pray about this. Hold on. Don't, don't be emotionally hijacked yet. That's up to us not to let that happen. So we do experience some suffering, but we also participate in his risen life. And then it says, ultimately, that experience is through the resurrection of our body in the future. Say amen. amen. Happy about that. But it also consists of an inward renewal in the midst of the challenges and troubles of our daily existence now. We still have that inner man be renewed day by day that flushing out of the old wrong thinking and lining up, conforming our minds with the word of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, right? You know that one? That you would transform your mind by the renewing of God through the word of God, through his spirit, through being accountable to other people who can help you walk this life, even with the troubles and the struggles. Like I said, connection brings protection. When you're with other people that have a like-minded walk with the Lord, they're going to help you have a stronger immune system. And the, all this isolation didn't help that one, did it? Our hope is therefore not a release from our bodies, but a resurrection of our bodies. All right? Can you say that with me? Our hope is not a release from our bodies, but a resurrection of our bodies. So the life that's inside us now will show outside as well. Man, those two ladies in the bay in their wheelchairs are real happy about this one. So even on the outside, it's going to show. I'm going to be able to get in a swimsuit again. Hallelujah. While we still suffer, this hope of a bodily resurrection is a matter of faith, not sight. I walk by faith, not by sight. Very specifically, the faith of knowing that I'm going to have a new resurrected body on the other side. And then I love this one too in the message in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I'll be spending a little bit more time on resurrection. It says the seed is sown in natural, right? The seed sown is natural, but the seed grown is supernatural. Get the picture? On this side, gravity's pulling us down. On the other side, we're walking in the supernatural physical body. But the same seed, same body, what a difference! From when it goes down in physical mortality to when it's raised up in spiritual immortality. That's, that's the hope that we have, and I'm almost done here. I just want to think through a couple things with you because this idea that God doesn't want one person to perish, often the biggest critics and the people that, that complain the loudest are the strongest witnesses when they get saved. And this is a story that a lot of you might know about a man named Lee Strobel, who was an attorney who was working for a newspaper in Chicago. His wife went to Bill Hybels Church and got saved. And there was a series of steps that happened before she went to the church. They were in a rush, a pizza parlor, and their daughter got a big piece of gum out of one of those machines, you know, those big balls, and she started choking on it. And one of the people at the other tables helped them get the gum out and, you know, they were very grateful, and the lady said to Bill Hobbles and his wife, oh, uh, it, you weren't lucky that I was here. The Lord told me to come here tonight. <laughs> and, uh, and she's like, what? The Lord told you what? You know, should we call the psych ward here or what? You're hearing voices? But the lady knew that that lady being in the restaurant allowed her daughter to be alive. And then it just started to really tick away, and her husband was getting more and more upset about this. So long story short, he goes up to one of his co-workers at the newspaper who he knew was a Christian, and he says, hey, I need you to help me. My wife joined your cult. Help me understand how I can talk her out of it. And the guy, like right in the moment, whoever this guy was that was his co-worker was so present to the moment that he kept his cool. He didn't say, well, I'm insulted that you would think I'm in a cult or anything. And the guy just immediately comes back and says, oh, that's easy. You want to discredit your wife's belief? Just discredit the resurrection. The whole thing is a house of cards that will collapse if Jesus didn't literally die from the dead. Rise from the dead, sorry. How many of us would have known to say that? But you do now. The resurrection's real. 500 people saw him, right? So then you see this long journey this attorney goes on to disprove the resurrection. Flies to Rome like he's talking to people all over the planet to try to make the case. 
and he doesn't, he gets saved. And the scene when he gets saved is very powerful. And he comes in, he lets his wife know that he decided to, to receive Jesus and that he's a Christian now and that he was sorry for persecuting her for her faith. I have a friend who's on the board of Lee Strobel Ministries today. They've sold over 15 million copies of his books, okay? Think of the impact, global impact of one person getting saved. And it was a, a Christian in a pizza parlor that was praying which restaurant to go to and the Lord let, let, leads her here. And then it's a co-worker at the newspaper who didn't have the title of minister but had enough presence to be present to the moment and say, easy, disprove it by disproving the resurrection. And within a couple of years, the guy's a Christian. And now he's sold 15 million books to help other people become Christians. See how it works? Anybody think you're not qualified to serve the Lord? Nobody's saying yes, that's good. I'm happy to hear that. Because I'm ending with just some... Um, thoughts, okay, about, about how we can think about this new life. Because remember last time I talked about the cycle of death that was put into place when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. It causes this deterioration over time. It causes people to sin. It causes people to get into sexual sin and adultery and all these things. Because the, the temptation starts typically, there's spiritual adultery happening before the actual act happens. And we can shortcut that cycle of sin. We can be accountable to one another and we can get somebody to pray with us and say, hey, there was a new person hired on my job and you know, I'm feeling some chemistry and it's not good and I don't want to give in to any of that stuff. Would you pray with me? My co connection with other believers brings me protection. But we have to avail ourselves of that and look around. You have plenty of people here who are willing to help. So you know, this is such beautiful language. I had to repeat it from two weeks ago. It's Song of Solomon. And he said, come away with me. I've come as you have asked to draw you to my heart and lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one. That's Jesus speaking to us as the bride. And like, look, you've been living an existence here, and yes, life is tough. We all have to deal with some really difficult things. But keep your eyes on the prize. Walk by faith. I'm going to come. There's going to be a day that you're going to be my bride and that we're going to rule and reign together for eternity so while you're here, these light and momentary afflictions, this is what Paul said, right? These light and momentary afflictions don't have any comparison to the weight of the eternal glory that we're going to have while we rule and reign with him. So I love this. He's talking to me. Come away with me. I've come as you've asked. I'm going to draw you to my heart and lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one. The season has changed. The bondage of your barren winter has ended. I think we should stand. I, I want to like, I want to put my foot down, right? I want to emphasize the bondage of my barren winter has ended. It'd be good to speak it into the atmosphere. Say it. The bondage of my barren winter has ended. I'm not going to live in slavery to isolation and cut myself off from other people and, and the life-giving relationships that I have. And then it says the season of hiding is over and gone. Yeah. So that's not for today. Look at the beautiful day we got out here. It's amazing, right? Like, be outside. Be around people. Keep the mask off when you're outside, okay? Come on. Like, you've been seeing, you see people driving down the highway alone in their car, and they got the mask on. I'm not trying to shame anybody, but you just get so used to the wrong way of thinking that you forget. Like, no, outside, you can take the mask off. It's beautiful. I don't care if people get mad at me, you know, like, some people are still hung up. Like, they're on the other side of the street and they're giving you a dirty look for being outside without a mask on. Like, you need Jesus. Oh. Hopefully, we're loving them through that and not shaming them, right? I love this. The rains have soaked the earth and left it bright with blossoming flowers. The season for singing has arrived. Amen. Come on, let's receive that word. Over my life, the season of singing has arrived. I'm taking down my harp from the willow tree because God has given me a new song. Hallelujah. Now let's just make some declarations before you leave because I said what was finished, right? The cycle of death was finished. Since Jesus didn't sin, death could not hold him because the wages of sin is death. But if you don't sin, there's no death. 
so death could not hold you. We sing it in that song, what a beautiful name. You have no rival. You have no equal. Death could not hold you. Hallelujah. But that same spirit is living inside me and you. Amen? So let's say it out loud. Winter has passed. Springtime has come. What has finished? Living a hopeless existence is over. Say it. Living a hopeless existence is over. God has a plan for me. Say it. God has a plan for me. I'm no longer separated from a loving father by sin. I'm no longer stumbling in the dark without Holy Spirit's guidance. You could do it with me. No longer falling prey to destructive behavior and self-loathing. I'm no longer an orphan living. Woo! Why? Well, I want to say that one again. No longer an orphan living on counterfections and gruel. You know what gruel is, right? Like, it's barely enough to keep you alive. And that's, that's what the devil gives you. He keeps you... It's like a drug dealer. He doesn't want you to take an overdose. He wants you just sick enough that you need him. But if he gives you too much, he loses the customer. That's what gruel is. It's like, yeah, there's a little nourishment in there, but why would you have that meal? Why would you go with the counterfeit when Jesus is saying, you could come to me. I'm the bread of life. I'm the water that you need. Lady at the well, you drink the water I give you, you're never going to be thirsty again. You're not going to look to other things to satisfy you. Oh, thank you, God. I'm no longer denied access to the kingdom of God in the earth. One more time. I'm no longer denied access to the kingdom of God in the earth. I'm no longer living in moral bankruptcy, destroying the lives of others. Can I just stop there for a minute? Some of us feel a lot of shame about the sin in our lives. I'm one of them that created so much wreckage in the lives of the people that I was with. I didn't know, right? I have a feeling that might be one of the thorns in the flesh that Paul is talking about, that he couldn't forget the bad decisions that he made didn't just impact him, it impacted a lot of other people. But so can we just repent of that right now and say, Lord, forgive me for any way my actions might have caused pain to other people. But I choose to forgive myself because you forgive me. Your word says as far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed my transgressions from me. Let's just pray that sets in somebody's heart right now. Your past is behind you. Okay? God has forgotten about it. The enemy will still bring charges against you, but you can tell him my record has been expunged no record. You have no, no charge against me legally. But remember, he doesn't have authority, but he has the power of the lie. So you've got to know the truth to counter it. All right, I'm almost done. No longer living under slavery and bondage of addictions. One more time. No longer living under the slavery and bondage of addiction. So Lord, if anybody here is dealing with an addiction, anybody on the live stream that's watching, Lord, if they're dealing with an addiction, we ask you to be stronger than the strong man. Whoever that strong man is in their life, if it's pornography, if it's whatever, eating disorders. There's so many ways the devil tries to kill us with addictions. Controlled substances, heroin, whatever it is, Lord, be stronger than the strong man in their lives. We ask you to break the power of that addiction through the power of your spirit in their lives and our lives. And the last one, I no longer hate myself. I know that I am lovable and that I am loved. Say it again. I no longer hate myself. I know that I am lovable and loved. Last time, I no longer hate myself. I know that I'm lovable and loved. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I remember my wife, as the Lord was bringing healing into her, her heart, she would stand in front of the mirror and speak truth over herself. She would look at herself pointed herself in the mirror to break the lie. She took the truth of the word and broke the lie that had been spoken over her. And it might take a little radical behavior like that, but it's not worth staying in bondage. Amen? Could you lift your hands for me? I just want to release a prayer of blessing over you all as you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and, and show favor to you in your life. That as you walk, his presence would shine through you to other people. 
And as you fill yourself up with the word of God, as you open your mouth, it will be God's thoughts. It will be God's words that are coming out of us because the pump that's driving us is not sin any longer, but it's going to be the truth of God's word right for that moment, right in that situation. The cycle of death is broken. We walk by faith, not by what we see with our eyes or because in our faith we're pressing towards the prize of eternity with a resurrected body. I just bless your people to walk in the fullness of your power this week in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Love you all. If you guys need prayer, we just come right up that aisle. We'll have people up here at the altar to pray. If this is new to you and you want somebody to pray with you, please come up to the altar so that we can be with you and pray.